and he said on the way the uh, scene on the streets was unbelievable there were severed limbs severed human limbs lying houses were torched these some of these limbs had been burned and the stench was unbearable we had to go through that in that veritable hell for several for more than an hour until we reached the medical college hospitals fortunately we found nur mohammad's wife was unhurt uh, unhurt so we picked her up and then we drove back to wherever ashok mitra was uh, posted and nur mohammad was posted and um, well that was that <laughs> it is a great honor and also a matter of pleasure for me to speak on a subject which is very dear to my heart and which i have been researching for many years see in west bengal the cultural ethos was suffused by communist thinking and the communists as well as the congress they always tried to hide these communal disturbances or uh, hindu muslim cases uh, under a cover so that people did not get to know about them i think that is a very dishonest way to do things because history should never be hidden and there is a saying by the spanish philosopher george santayana that those who hide uh, forget their history are condemned to repeat it uh, you would get get an idea of how far hidden the history of the exodus of hindus from east pakistan is as compared to that of west pakistan because on the western that is the punjabi uh, exodus punjab partition there are a large number of books there are books by uh, both fiction and non fiction by kushwant singh by um, gs khosla by penderel moon by sadat hasan manto on the other side of the border and several others i think there must be at least no less than 20 books on the subject plus motion pictures and all that as opposed to that about the eastern exodus of hindus that is exodus from east bengal there are very few books and practically none in english or hindi so that they are barred to the all india audience there are three or four in bengali which are not accessible to the all india audience the com- only the first complete book so to say was written by yours truly that is a book uh, titled uh, uh, my people uprooted i shall presently show you that book but um, before that a few others have taken up that book this is the book that i wrote and it contains among other things the um, a description of the subject of today's talk that is the great calcutta killings of 1946 you see the great calcutta killings <coughs> began in a very interesting way to if we are to believe molana azad molana abul kalam azad as he has recorded in his autobiography india wins freedom it began with an act of jawarlal nehru you see this book of molana azad was published after his death but not the whole book he had built that 30 pages of this book would be published 30 years later 
and therefore although he died in 1957 the 30 pages were published in it could be 30 pages or less and less a number of pages they were published in 1987 now according to this book uh, the last pages of the book the um, there was a uh, british high power committee called the cabinet mission which had come to india in 1946 whose intention was to grant independence to India without dividing India. So Muslim League was all along agitating for dividing India, but the, at that time, the British government was not in favor of dividing India, and they wanted to give independence to India without dividing it. So the Muslim League conferred with the leaders of different parties Congress and Muslim League, of course, and all other parties also, Hindu Mahasabha, Kali Party, all these. And eventually, they uh, formed a plan called the Grouping Plan. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the Grouping Plan. It's quite complicated. But according to the Grouping Plan, there would be a weak center, strong states, and the country would remain undivided. Now... This grouping plan was agreed to by both the Congress and the uh, Muslim League. Uh, Muslim League, I believe, did it reluctantly, but what, whatever. But at that time, Molana Azad was the president of the Indian National Congress. On the, he handed over his mantle to Jawaharlal Nehru. He has said that I meant to hand it over to Sardar Patel, but because of certain circumstances, I had to hand it over to Jawaharlal Nehru. And Jawaharlal Nehru made a horrible mistake. Mistake or intentional or whatever. On the 10th of July, 1946, he held a press conference in Bombay, then Mumbai, uh, now Mumbai, when he said, that this grouping plan is not going to work and we are going to enter the constituent assembly without ourselves feeling fettered by any kind of previous agreements. In other words, he was negating the acceptance of the grouping plan, which was earlier on agreed by the Congress and the Muslim League. Now, Jinnah was under some pressure within his party, within the Muslim League, for having accepted this uh, plan. So Jinnah saw this opportunity, and he said that uh, the Hindus can't be trusted. I knew this was going to happen. So now we are going to withdraw the acceptance to the uh, cabinet mission's grouping plan. And that was the end of undivided India. And he also announced that he was going to have a direct action sometime. He didn't mention when, he didn't mention where, and he didn't mention what form this direct action was going to take. So this raised a lot of questions. The newspaper men asked him, that, uh, is this direct action is going to be, sir, is it going to be uh, violent or non-violent? Jinnah said, I am not going to discuss ethics. And after that, he said nothing. But the direct action was being put into action by the governor or by, by the uh, government of undivided Bengal, the premier of which was Suravardi of Hussein Shahid Suravardi of the Muslim League. In that, during that time, you know, after 1937, the provincial governments were being run by elected governments of ele elected uh, governments of parties belonging to Indians, but with a British governor at top. The uh, British governor for Bengal was a person called Sir Frederick Burroughs, just as the British governor of Punjab at that time was one Sir Evan Jenkins. Now, what had happened is that people started a lot of speculation about what this 
direct action was going to be like. And a lot of people made fun of direct action also. But nobody said anything clearly about it. Only once or twice something came out in some papers here and there in Calcutta, which gave an indication that this direct action was going to be enacted in Calcutta. And uh, it was not going to be a very tame affair. But uh, people still, log yeah, what is this direct action? Let us see. We, we wish all, uh, even Hindus were saying, we all wish we success to the direct action. But some people, like say, for instance, at that time, Calcutta had a mayor called Hassan Usman. He had let out a handbill which said that this is, we are going to embark on the direct action. The call of this has come from Kedi Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. This is the, uh, this is the uh, ambition of every Muslim to fight with an open bared sword. And if we die here, we'll straight go to heaven, etc. And we'll get our hoors, etc., etc. All these things. But nobody still took him seriously. Surawardi, who was the premier at that time, he declared a holiday on the 16th of, uh, 16th of August. There was some halabaloo in the state assembly, the provincial assembly, as to why he was declaring a holiday. But he didn't listen to anyone. He declared a holiday. On the 16th of August morning, there was a huge gathering in Kol, uh, Calcutta Maidan. Calcutta has a huge Maidan. Those of you who are familiar with the city would know. And that Maidan is used to hold uh, very mammoth meetings. So in this meeting, uh, this uh, Suravardi addressed the gathering. The gathering consisted almost, why almost, absolutely entirely of Muslims who had come uh, not only from Calcutta but the environment, uh, by the um, adjoining areas, including the jute mill laborers. And strangely, they had come all with lethal weapons. Like somebody had, some had come with spears, some had come with swords, some had come with uh, stones. If if somebody, some who had guns, they came with guns and all that. Now, how did they get to know that such a thing was necessary? This was done entirely by word of mouth. There was no public declaration. Uh, one or two things like that statement by Usman I mentioned. That was there, but no very clear declaration as to what uh, form this thing was going to take. Now, Suravardi, in that meeting at the Calcutta Maidan, he announced that the day for direct action has arrived. Before that, Jinnah had said one thing. He had said, today we bid goodbye to all constitutional methods. We have forged a pistol and we are in a position to use it. That is all he said. Now, Suravardi said in the meeting, Jinnah was not present in the meeting. Suravardi said in the meeting that you are uh, now called upon to undertake direct action. And most importantly, I have asked the police and the military not to interfere. Now, what does that mean? Not to interfere, not to interfere in what? Not to interfere in murder and mayhem. And that is what he had actually instructed the police. He had also uh, sort of uh, played with the police officials so that at the very top, there was a police official called Muhammad Shamsud Doha, who was MS Doha, who was Jinnah's, who was um, Surawardi's direct henchman. And with these things, that direct action started. First, they started looting shops, including a gun shop. 
picked up a lot of guns. Then they started going all over town and killing Hindus. Now Hindus were not prepared for it because there was no warning, nothing was mentioned, nothing, there was no news about it, as I mentioned. So Hindus just started dying like flies. Um, people who had never suspected that their neighbor would attack them were surprised. And then the surprise didn't last very long because they died. They were stabbed immediately thereafter. In the Muslim areas where there were pockets of Hindus, they, all, they were all um, summarily killed. There was a small pocket of Odias in a place in a uh, totally Muslim area called Matyaburus. In this Matyaburus area, that small Odia pocket had some 300 or 400 Odias. And the Odias had been warned by the police to clear out of that place. But the Odias didn't do it. They paid no heed to it. They were killed off in 10 minutes. So 300 or 400 Odias, they were killed off. The simple laborers killed off in 10 minutes. This happened, this went on over the whole city. Governor Barros, it is said, he went out in a police car, toured the whole of the city, and he decided that it was not necessary to call out the military. You can imagine how biased he was, this Governor Barros was, in favor of the Muslim League. And then this went on. This went on for the whole of the 16th. People died like flies. Houses, Hindu houses were set on fire. Uh, uh, Hindu uh, boatmen on the river, they were rammed by Muslim boatmen in their motor launches and sunk. And in every possible way, they were killed. Some little pockets, there was some sanity among the people, and the Muslims did not indulge in this kind of murder and mayhem, but they were very few and far between, and it's mostly uh, the one story of murder and mayhem. The same thing continued the next day on the 17th. But meanwhile, the Hindus had started organizing because they realized that this is not a situation in which Ahimsa is going to work. Ahimsa is all right against the British, but Ahimsa was not going to work. It doesn't work against the Taliban. It doesn't work against um, any kind of uh, um, uh, any marauders, and certainly it was not going to work here. So they got organized, and the lead was given You'd be surprised to know by the Sardarjis. They were at that time a large number of Sardars in Calcutta who were mostly in the transport business. In fact, the entire transport network, particularly the bus network, was run by Sardars. In addition to that, there were uh, the uh, Bihari Kalwars. Kalwars are iron mongers. In one particular area, they usually have the name of Jaiswal. The Jaiswals, they also got together with the Sardars. And of course, there were Bengali Hindus, a very large number of them who were, um, uh, who were led by one Gopal Pata. Gopal Pata actually means a goat. Gopal Pata was a butcher who had a butcher's shop in which Jhatka meat was sold. sold. Uh, Gopal Pata, his name was Gopal Mukherjee. But he was a Brahmin. But he was named Gopal Pata because he was slaughtering Patas. So these groups, they got together and they started retaliating. And Saravati never thought that Hindus would be able to retaliate because then he thought that these are Mahatma Gandhi's chelas. They, are, they believe in Ahimsa. They won't be able to do anything. So we would be able to conquer the whole city and the whole of Calcutta would go to Pakistan. That was the main intention. See, at that, that time, Calcutta was not the lackluster or third city or fourth city of India. It was a very thriving city. The, the uh, fountainhead of all 
commercial and industrial, particularly industrial activity in India. And uh, the city was inhabited by people from various parts of India. Uh, it was said to be the second city in the British Commonwealth after London. In terms of population, at least it was the second city. Bombay was far behind. So Calcutta was chosen as the stage of uh, the as the stage for this direct action, and it uh, process started. Now on the second day evening, the Hindus started retaliating, and on the third day, from the third day, the Hindus and the Sikhs they started retaliating with such ferocity that. This person, Suravardi, could never imagine they were capable of this ferocity. He had all along thought that these people, uh, Mahatma Gandhi ke chele hai, they, uh, uh, they are followers of Ahimsa, they will just put their necks forward and we will uh, chop off their necks, nothing more to be done about it. But the Muslim areas began to be torched, the Muslims began to be killed. And by, by that time, Suravardi was forced to bring out the uh, British troops. At that time, there were a lot of British troops in Calcutta and uh, the Indian troops also. The police force was manned by Anglo-Indians to a large extent. These Anglo-Indians also sat uh, as, so, I mean, just watching, mute watchers. They were also told to move. And the, uh, this retaliation went on on the uh, 18th and 19th. And by 19th, it's not a very nice thing to say, but the Hindus and Sikhs, they had even the score, more than even the score, with the result that. One of the uh, very authentic descriptions of the great Calcutta killings has mentioned that Suravardi was sitting in the police control room in a very forlorn mood and holding his hand, holding the forehead in his hand and mumbling to himself, oh, my poor innocent Muslims, my poor innocent Muslims. Nobody wants the Muslims to be killed, but they began the process. So that was that. And in this process, the thing uh, gradually stopped on the 19th. Now, one of the chroniclers of this uh, Great Calcutta killings was a person called Ashok Mitra. Ashok Mitra was an ICS officer. There are actually two Ashok Mitra. One was an economist who was also a communist. And the other one was an ICS officer who later on became the census commissioner of India. This Ashok Mitra has written an autobiography. He had, in his autobiography, he has mentioned that he was at that time posted in somewhere just outside Calcutta. At that time, he had an underling called uh, some uh, Muslim person, Noor Muhammad or something like that his name. This Noor Muhammad's wife had been uh, hospitalized in a Calcutta hospital. And Noor Muhammad was going mad uh, with worry about his wife, what had happened to his wife. So uh, he said that he went and caught hold of Ashok Mitra's feet and he said that, uh, sir, you must do something. What could the poor fellow do? The ICS officer or anything, nobody had the power to do anything against this organized mayhem. But Ashok Mitra said, right now, nothing is possible. After the riots abate, we'll see what we can do. Then they started out in a car. His driver flat re flatly refused. He said, I can't go to Calcutta. I won't go to Calcutta. So you can sack me or you can do whatever you like. Then Ashok Mitra himself drove the car. And he said, on the way, the uh, scene on the streets was unbelievable. There were severed limbs, severed human limbs lying. Houses were torched. These, some of these limbs had been burned and the stench was unbearable. We had to go through that in that veritable hell for 
several for more than an hour until we reached the medical college hospitals. Fortunately, we found Noor Muhammad's wife was unhurt, uh, unhurt. So we picked her up and then we drove back to wherever Ashok Mitra was uh, posted and Noor Muhammad was posted. And um, well, that was that. Uh, other chroniclers of the riots. Uh, I'll mention uh, Stanley Wolpert. Stanley Wolpert was an American researcher into several subjects concerning India. He has written a biography of Jinnah, which is called the Jinnah of Pakistan. It's a must-read book for anyone who is interested in the, in the history of India during that period. He has mentioned that <clears throat> at that time, he had, um, no, it was he or Ashok Mitra, one of the two, they had mentioned that there was a uh, British general called Sir Francis Tucker. This France, Sir Francis Tucker and, uh, uh, and Suravati once, they had occasion to travel together in a car in Calcutta before the riot started. And uh, at that time, there was this, uh, this atmosphere of tension between Hindus and Muslims. And uh, this uh, Francis Tucker, General Francis Tucker, he said that, I find this very strange. Because in the army, we have both Hindus and Muslims. Remember, that was the undivided Indian army. In the army, we have Hindus and Muslims, and they all work shoulder to shoulder. So Raudhi said, we'll put a stop to that. Don't you worry. You can imagine what sort of an attitude they had. So uh, among the other things, this person, uh, Stanley Wolpert. Stanley Wolpert has... Uh, describe the attitudes of Englishmen. I have already mentioned what the attitude of Governor Burroughs was. Then there was uh, the main garrison, army garrison in the middle of Calcutta is in a fort called Fort William. The uh, officer commanding in the Fort William was one Brigadier J.P.C. McKinley. This J.P.C. McKinley, he told his troops that you can go to sleep. You don't have anything to do. That was on the first day of the riot. So no policeman came out. The second day, uh, uh, in the, towards the evening, when uh, things started going bad for the Muslims, then Surawardi called out the, uh, the troops. Some Indian troops came out, some British troops came out, but British troops came out in large numbers only towards the very end of the riots. And when they came out, they were surprised at the, the ferocity with which the two communities have killed each other. Unbelievable. Now, the thing to understand in this is that not who killed whom, but number one is who started this whole business. They were very cynical people. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, he thought nothing of sending some thousands of his own people to hell uh, only to get his own Pakistan. Not only that, he corrupted, he prostituted the entire uh, governmental machinery to uh, subserve his nefarious uh, needs mainly to stage the riot and to kill Hindus. Surawardi did the same, and uh, they did not reckon with the fact that Calcutta was a Hindu majority city. They all along said, all along thought that these are Ahimsas, Ahimsa, uh, Gandhiji's chelas, they will not be able to retaliate. So this, in short, is a very short history of the Calcutta riots. Uh, it's a very, very sad chapter in the 
history of India, particularly those days uh, immediately before and immediately after partition. Uh, as a matter of fact, this Great Calcutta killings, uh, also known as the direct action, were a blot on the city, where before that, there were no major riots. There were killings, stabbings, that sort of thing, but there were no major riots. And generally, the relations between the two communities had been good. But after that, the, the relations got poisoned, and a um, lot of Muslims left for East Pakistan, but many of them came back after what is known as the Nehru Liakat Pact of 1950. Now, that is a different chapter altogether. I don't want to go into it. But so far as this direct action day or 16th August is concerned, this is more or less. Oh, one thing I must add. Very, very strangely, the present West Bengal government, under the chief ministership of Mamta Banerjee, has decided to observe this day as Khala Hobe. Khala Hobe is a slogan. Khala Hobe means Khaloga. So Khala Hobe is a slogan that these people had used. They had borrowed it from some Bangladeshi uh, politician. And they had used this slogan in the uh, 2021 elections, which in which they won with a thumping majority on the 2nd of May 2021. And that uh, their victory was to a large extent due to the mismanagement of the elections by the BJP itself. BJP was the second party, but the elections were so badly mismanaged by the BJP that uh, they saw almost got a walkover. So choosing for her to choose this horrible day, the 16th of August, as her Khala Habe Divas, is very curious and very intriguing. A lot of us have objected to it. I don't know what made her do it. She has not given any explanation. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity and wish you all a very happy Independence Day, which we had today. Vande Matram, Jai Hind, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. I would like to read uh, something, uh, what Dr. B. R. Ambedkar wrote in his book mm. about Muslim politics. Mm. He said, Muslim politics is gangster's method of politics. Mm. And then H. V. Shishadri has amplified the same point when he said that the Muslim political behavior revolves around acrimony, ac accusations, complaints, demands, denunciations, and finally street writing. And this is followed by playing the victim. He says this is a practice routine. And yet our leadership from, say, 1920s itself has always sought to dissemble or appease or bend and surrender to them. And this, this has become the hallmark right from the days of the Khilafat movement. This is Sanjay Dikshit's um, interpretation of it. Yes, that this is a very important observation, and I completely agree with what Ambedkarji had said, and um, what Sanjay Dikshinji had said. You see, you mentioned the Khilafat movement. The Khilafat movement had uh, is very little is known to the citizens of India today, because we are under some kind of obligation. Uh, imposed, of course, by the so-called quote-unquote secular politicians and secular historians of India, like Romila Thapar, Bipan Chandra, Harbans Bukhya, all these people, that thou shalt not speak ill of the Muslims. Thou shalt not speak ill of the Muslims. A Muslim can do no wrong. Why is it? Just as a Hindu can do wrong, a Sikh can do wrong, a Muslim can also do wrong. So why shouldn't this be? See, this has come from Mahatma Gandhi's idea that the Hindu-Muslim unity has to be achieved at any cost. That is why in the Khilafat movement, the Khilafat movement actually finally culminated in a uh, pogrom of Hindus. 
in the Malabar part of Kerala, at that time it was part of Madras presidency, there was a wholesale killing of Hindus by the Mopala Muslims. It is called Mopala rebellion, but it is not a rebellion. It's a Hindu killing. And Gandhi he tried to whitewash it by saying that they are very religious people. They have done what their religion tell, tells them. Because your religion tells you to kill me, I, should I proffer my neck so that you can chop it off? I don't subscribe to that idea, however great Mahatma Gandhi may be and whatever. This is uh, uh, a totally wrong way of looking at it. Sir, uh, this is what happened here also. Uh, in the great Calcutta killings, after three days, when the Hindus under Gopal Patha started reta retaliating, uh, Gandhiji immediately came from North Lee and he asked him to, you know, be to pacify and to give up arms. And yes, uh, yes, he rejected yes. it on his face and walked away. Mm. And this is uh, intriguing what you said about Kela Hobe. Because mm. last week we had uh, somebody called Pua Chaudhary from Dhaka who spoke mm -hmm. about the 1971 pogrom that uh, the genocide that Pakistan right. did in Bangladesh. Yes. And in that, he showed in his documentary, he has uh, roped in many expatriate Pakistanis who were then a part of it. And one of the ex-Pakistan army person said that, yes, when the genocide began in Bangladesh, he said, I got a call from my colleague. He said, yeah, the fun has begun. So, you know, to... You, to use words as khela, to use words as fun. This brings me to a very uh, important thing that I can't help mentioning. You know, we all know about Jallianwala Bagh. Jallianwala Bagh is said to be an enormous, horrendous massacre of unarmed people. I think some 1,400 people were killed in it. There is a place called Chuknagar, now in Bangladesh, hardly 40 kilometers from the Indian border, where there was a similar massacre by the Pakistani army of unarmed Hindus, mostly women and children. And do you know how many people were killed in one day? 10,000 people were killed in one day. The waters of the local river, they ran, ran, ran red. Unbelievable. And Pakistan army, the, who were shooting, they ran out of ammunition, then they bayoneted these people, then they trampled them with cars. And uh, horrible, it's, uh, it's uh, beyond description. The name of the place is Chuknagar, by a Bangladeshi author called uh, Muntasir Mamun. He has written about it very feelingly, and this is his writing is in English. I would recommend to everyone. Jallianwala Bagh was horrible, but this Jallianwala Bagh pales in, significant, in, in, uh, to, in insignificance compared to Chuknagar, mass murder. Thank you. And Please go ahead. Sir, is it ironic or is it unfortunate that we, on the other part of the country, haven't even heard of this? This is news to me, what you're telling now. Yes, I'll tell you the reason why. The reason is that this entire cultural ethos of West Bengal has been suffused, has been overshadowed by Marxists and Congressites who have all along been saying that this is, thou shalt not speak ill of the Muslims. And it is because of that that this thing is not done. That is why I would recommend that this poor man, this book that he has written, if any of you uh, will kindly um, buy it and read it. I mean, apart from the fact that it will get me a little bit of money, but um, uh, it, it really contains a lot of information which is not available anywhere else. There is a name, there is a name of the road in Calcutta by the name of Swalwardi. Is it uh, of the same butcher of Bengal or somebody else? See, I am not very sure about this, the answer to this question, because there were four notable Suravardis all of the same family, and not all four were villains. The eldest Suravardi was one Sir Zedar Zahid Suravardi was a non-political person. He was a uh, judge of the Calcutta High Court. 
Then there were two Hassan Surawardis. One Hassan Surawardi was the elder brother of this Hussein Surawardi. And uh, this uh, uh, one Hassan Surawardi, he was an art critic. He eventually went to Pakistan, but he was not a communal person. The other Hassan Surawardi was his Dr. Hassan Surawardi, who was a vice chancellor of a university. These were all non-political persons. It is only the Hussein Surawardi, Hussein Shahid Surawardi, who was the real villain, who was not just a villain, but he was also a horrible womanizer. If you read the Freedom at Midnight, that book by Dominique Lapierre and Larry Collins, you'd find a description of him. Uh, I am not very sure as to which, which Surawardi it is named after. I have tried to find out, but so far I have drawn a blank. I'll uh, still keep on uh, trying to find out. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. Sir, can you please shed some light about the role of Mujibur Rahman in this direct, day, direct action day? Mujibur Rahman was the office secretary of the Muslim League at that time. So he definitely had something to do with the direct action. But what he did is unclear. He wasn't a very big wig. I mean, he wasn't one of the leaders. The main leader was Surawardi. Apart from that, there were other people like Abdullah Hill Baki, then uh, Usman, SN Usman and a few others. But uh, Surawardi definitely had something to do. He has mentioned it also in his unfinished autobiography, which is in, which is in Bengali. And in that unfinished autobiography, of course, he has dished out a lot of uh, things which are not literally uh, believable, uh, really believable. Say, for instance, uh, there was a leader called Abul Hashim. He had said that this is, uh, Abul Hashim had told him, he was a junior man, so Abul Hashim was much senior. Abul Hashim apparently had told him that this fight is not against the Hindus, but against the British. It's all nonsense. I don't believe any of it. He was, uh, um, oh, uh, he was uh, just sort of uh, whitewashing it. But to give the devil his due, after he went back to East Pakistan, he became a changed person. He left the Muslim League. He started the Awami League. Surawardi also started the, uh, began the Awami League. And uh, they um, tried to give some kind of safety to Hindus in East Pakistan. That wasn't worth much. It's more for show than anything else. So that was all about Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, my question is about the Congress leaders. What was their role in all this? And also, what was uh, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee's role? If you could shed some light on that. Yes. Thank you. Good question. See, the Congress leaders, they were all followers of Mahatma Gandhi. So they could not say anything about any, uh, any uh, taking to arms or fighting them. So Congress leaders were just duds. They just sat there doing nothing. Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee was not in power. The party in power was Muslim League. And they had an absolute majority in the state assembly. As a matter of fact, I mean, if I go back a little bit in history, in 1944, there was a Gandhi Jinnah talks, you know. That was a very ill-advised thing that Gandhiji did, going over to Jinnah and trying to talk him into accepting uh, some kind of compromise. He did it at the uh, upon the advice of Chakraborty Rajagopalacheri. But it was a very wrong thing to do because it uh, put Jinnah in a light that I mean it, it uh, projected to the whole of the country where Jinnah was the sole representative of Muslims. Before that, there were a lot of other people. Like, for instance, in Punjab, there was Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, who used to lead a party called the Unionist Party. It was a very powerful party. And Sikandar Hayat Khan was a uh, secular person. Then after, after him, there was Khizar Hayat Tiwana. And... Um, 
several other people here and there, Sir Choturam, all these people. But uh, when Gandhiji went to uh, Jinnah and showed to the country that in his view, Jinnah was the representative of all the Muslims in the country, all these parties broke and they all came and joined the Muslim League. So that was a very horrible thing uh, uh, to happen. And uh, uh, after that, there was no stopping, stopping, there was no stopping Jinnah. As for Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, after the uh, uh, riots had abated, he had lambasted Suravardi in the state assembly. And he had said that, you know, in um, Europe, there was a great massacre of, in France, there was a great massacre of Protestants by Catholics on a day called the St. Bartholomew's Day. And he had said that this is to the great Calcutta killings was something in which the St. Bartholomew's uh, Day pales into insignificance. He had mentioned this because this would be readily understandable to foreign uh, journalists and all that. But he couldn't do anything much more because first thing is Hindu Mahasabha had a very small following. Hindu vote was entirely with the Congress and the Congress did nothing. This is a, uh, this, this is a sad fact. Is total population exchange possible now, anyhow? It's not possible. It's not possible. It was possible earlier. And in 1950, there was a bloody pogrom engineered by the East Pakistan government, after which Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee had uh, advocated an exchange of population. But earlier on, there was an exchange of population in Punjab. Uh, as a matter of fact, after January 1948, there was hardly any uh, non-Muslim left in uh, Pakistan. And in Indian Punjab, except for one small place called Malerkotla, there were no Muslims left anywhere. So there was exchange of population. But from elsewhere, the Muslim stayed put. So in when Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee um, uh, uh, raised this subject in 1950, by that time, Nehru was much more firmly in saddle. Earlier on, Nehru could not do anything. As a matter of fact, he went to Mountbatten and he said, "We, I can't manage this country, you take over. He went to that extent. But in 1950, he was much more firm, firmly in saddle. So he said that, no, no, we can't do this. This is a matter, this is a matter of faith. The Muslims have reposed faith in us. They want to remain in India. That is nonsense. Nobody wants to leave his home and heart if he can leave, if he can help it. And Muslims did not want to move. They did not want, they did not move. Hindus also did not want to move, but they were forced to move from Pakistan. But Nehru uh, gave a picture as if the Muslims are staying on in India only because of they are doing some kind of favor to India by staying on. So this was how Nehru rebuffed it. And he was, at that time, Sardar Patel was very ill at that time. He died in another six months or six or eight months. And uh, Nehru was, after that, the uncrowned king of India, whatever he said uh, was law. So talking about uh, population exchange, there has been a, an author called Manto, who has written very poignantly. Tata Thassan uh, Manto. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. He talks about, pop, uh, you know, uh, the mad people, puzzles being exchanged from that's Pakistan. That's right. That's right. And, that yeah. book, uh, Toba Takes In. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and he writes that, I thought that the Hindus and Muslims would busy themselves in this war and their blood, which did not mix, mix in the mosque and in temple, their blood would finally mix in Bombay's gutters and drains. Mm. The original Suhavardi was a Sufi of the 12th century and founded the Sufi order called Suhavardiya. Could you please make a public note of this? Mm, I'm not aware of this. It's quite possible. Again, for the books, uh, 
Tathagat ji has shown one book, uh, My People Uprooted. He has written another book on Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Complete biography, I'll show it right away. This is that book. Okay. So this, uh, this has come out in Penguin edition. So will you say something about uh, what I just shared, that uh, today, even today, Hindus who are writing, um, say, anti-Muslim or, or are writing about this problem that you talked about, are being watched in West Bengal even today? They are being watched. But so far, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, persecution of people who have been speaking against the present government of West Bengal and uh, against Mamata Vanity. I had once made a Twitter remark, remark on Twitter, as a result of which an FIR was lodged against me. But uh, beyond that, nothing much had happened. Earlier on, once in 2011, I was put in prison for one day. For no reason, I was put on, at that time, I was just a retired professor of university. I was put in, uh, put in prison in charge for it, uh, again, for, on a charge of attempted murder. Can you believe it? But that is how the government here functions. Uh, Tathagaji has been controversial for his tweets because some retired army officer suggested that instead of, uh, this is after the Pulwama attack. When he yes. said that boycott, boycott the Kashmiris, uh, economically boycott them, stop buying from them, stop going there for tourism. And he retweeted that and then there was, he, you know, invited a lot of black. That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Would you like to share some of more of this? Well, I have made a lot of controversial tweets. Some of them uh, are more, some of them are less controversial. Oh, if, I, mm -hmm. if I was launched for it, I had mentioned that some temple was desecrated and I had mentioned we are Hindus. On that, uh, they, someone had launched an empire. Of course, it was politically engineered. Nobody would, uh, no ordinary person would go and uh, launch an lodge an empire. On the other hand, you know, there is a woman who had uh, been pictured on Twitter trying to put on a condom on a shivling. I had, yes, I had uh, filed an FIR, I mean, a police complaint against her, but nothing happened. Sir, any changes in history textbooks possible in near future to depict the real history in place of the doctored history we read in school? I understand some such, uh, some such thing is in progress. As a matter of fact, uh, lately I've been hearing of uh, a lot of this communist splitting that history is being changed, history is being changed. And uh, I think there is something in the offering. I don't know the details. These are uh, the Indian Council of Historical Research is the nodal body which does it. What is the role of the center and BSF in the influx of Bangladeshis? Yes, good question. You see, the border is policed by the BSF. And uh, in spite of the BSF being there, uh, and in spite of the lar larger part of the border between India and Bangladesh being fenced, still a lot of infiltration takes place and a lot of smuggling of cattle takes place from India to Bangladesh. Infiltration of humans from Bangladesh to India, infiltration and uh, smuggling of cattle from India to Bangladesh. This is a very vexed question, uh, the, particularly the cattle bit, because you'd be surprised to know where the cattle are coming from. West Bengal doesn't have that number of cattle. These cattle are coming from the area where people say, Gau Hamari Mata hai. They are coming from Rajasthan, Haryana, UP, all these places. When the cattle start giving, uh, uh, stop giving milk, then they sell them to Muslim butchers. And the Muslims send them to uh, West Bengal. And then, then this is the big money being made in this uh, uh, business, in this smuggling business. And I need not say much more. 
as for the infiltration of the human beings it is lessened to a great extent because of the fencing unfortunately quite a lot of area cannot be fenced because it is riverine border and you know the rivers on this side are very big very wide rivers particularly in the southern part of the border very wide rivers so it is quite difficult to uh, to police those rivers but to a large extent it has been uh, checked infiltration one more reason which has been checked is that the um, uh, modi ji has made a pact with sheikh hasina of by which the enclaves have been exchanged you know a peculiar thing was used to be there in the northern part of west bengal that there were certain pockets of indian territory inside bangladesh and pockets of bangladeshi territory inside india they were called enclaves and uh, the strangest thing is there was a pocket of indian territory inside bangladesh in which there was a pocket of bangladeshi territory so you can imagine what sort of a thing but this has been ironed out and this is to a large extent this has helped the infiltration and also the fact that bangladesh is progressing economically is one reason why um, people have also people in india have also become lot more conscious still there are a very large number of bangladesh infiltrators in places like bangalore mumbai uh, in delhi in places like simapuri and silampur uh, they are still there they i think number uh, i mean just of hand i would say they number no less than 10 lakhs in west bengal also there are a large number Hmm. It's just that that Babu, don't you see the same somnolence of Bengali Hindus nowadays too, aided by the high sense of Bengali identity? See, the Bengali identity is something that the present government, particularly Mamata Banerjee, is trying to rub in, and she has succeeded to a certain extent, but it is uh, um, to a very small extent because. Uh, first thing the bengalis don't have any enmity towards people from any other part of india bengali hindus don't have any kind of enmity not even the language see uh, bengalis are very very proud of the language but they don't have any uh, kind of um, uh, allergy to hindi as they have in tamil nadu so there is no bengali identity thing except among a very small number of people as for the uh, other thing that you mentioned bengal is somnolence i would say that it still persists it's not completely gone we are talking about firs for controversial expressions what is your position on article 295a article 295a what yeah, is that it's, it's about lodging firs for controversial expressions I think. See, lodging uh, FIRs. Let me have a look at deliberate and malicious acts intended to outrage religious feelings of any class by insulting its religion or religious views. See, I can say with some justice that Hindus do not do it as a class. Hindus or Sikhs or Jains, no follower of Indic religions, even Christians, don't do it. it is only one class of people who do it and it is done in certain parts of west bengal where there are numerous particularly in districts like murshidabad or malda there have been desecration of hindu temples there have been uh, uh, harassment of hindus but then take over of hindu lands even shamshan land the land for cremation uh, ghats uh, cremation ground they have been forcibly grabbed such so things happen over here sir what i want to find out is that with whatever historical facts you have presented and there are many more where uh, the so called uh, muslim community has butchered and killed mm. hindus in different parts of the country historically mm. i mean if we look at the you know the history of last 1000 years it's it's replete mm. with those kind of cases yes. even in the recent times after the election whatever happened in bengal uh, 
you know we have all seen that and after that if the chief minister of the state you know say oh on this date we are going to have a khela hobe day mm. right and khela hobe we all know where it has been picked up from it has been picked up from bangladesh a specific party who is known for its violence violence violent nature and they have demonstrated that as well on the street it's not that it is just in here yes now with all of that is cm saying that if i mean what do you think the 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 now cm is saying it's the only only person left over there is governor and uh, you have you happen to have played those roles not in that state but in other places what do you think as a governor what one should do see a governor i have been governor for 5 years and uh, i have had quite a few tiffs with the state government they have not come out in the open to the extent the problems between the west bengal governor and the west bengal government that come out but i have had problems in case of problems the governor's role is very limited uh, one thing that governor governor can do is he can block legislation secondly he can bring the matter to the notice of the central government when i was in meghalaya i my raj bhavan was once gerald by some 10000 or 12000 people because i had blocked the legislation but i refused to unblock it because i said that this is not within the jurisdiction of the state to legislate and eventually they went to him but it could have been very dangerous because the houses in meghalaya are mostly made of wood and if they had shown a thrown a petrol bomb the whole rajbhavan would have gone up in flames so uh, the governor can do precious little apart from that he can only block legislation and stuff like that not much more is hindu leadership confusion and lack of historical experience of islam or failure to understand islamic psychology is that the cause of hindus deterioration in republic of india i personally think so i'm not speaking on behalf of my party because right now i am not in any kind of position in the party but i personally think and i agree with the questioner could you please write a comprehensive book on the events that led to the direct action day this is a request to you but uh, that is a um, comprehensive book see i am not a professional historian you must understand that i am merely a history buff and one who got very interested in history so this ought to be written by a professional historian and the icihr indian council of historical research must take it up but i must tell you since you give me this opportunity to tell you why and how i became a history buff i'm a civil engineer of all things by profession and by training but when in i was in college bengal engineering college in 1964 uh, some uh, 10 15 students from the east pakistan university of engineering and technology they came and enrolled in our class now in an engineering college it is most unusual for people to come in at fourth year i was in fourth year so i talked to them and i found out that the sort of persecution torture and harassment that they had been subjected to was unbelievable at that time it was east pakistan bangladesh time is somewhat better not completely better but somewhat better east pakistan time they had to flee for their lives they sneaked into tripura then from tripura they flew to west bengal and then eventually they got admission in our college by hearing those, those people are eyewitnesses you know by hearing the stuff from them i uh, started wondering why does this uh, history not get written so i asked my parents my parents are were all both born in east bengal they my parents were born married in east bengal also so i asked my parents why doesn't this get recorded why doesn't this get documented they didn't have any good answer then i lost interest in this subject but over the years this uh, thing um, this seed 
sprouted in my brain and eventually became a tree. And then it bothered me to such an extent that I left my job in the Indian Railway Service of Engineers and I um, joined politics. And the politics gave me the chance to study these things, to write. And uh, that's why I have become, that's how and why I have become a history buff. But this question, the suggestion, that is a very good suggestion, but it must be sent to the ICHR. They are the correct people to do it. 